When it comes to health and wellness, good sleep is essential. Ashley invites you to a new era of sleep with the latest in sleep technologies. Experience all-night cooling with the Tempur-Pedic Breeze Collection or rest easy with adaptive pressure relief on the all-new Purple Collection thanks to its Gel Flex Grid. Don't lose sleep over choosing a new mattress. Your perfect fit is here at Ashley. Shop online or visit an Ashley store today. Better sleep starts here. Hundreds of documents unsealed just this afternoon, revealing new details in the Delphi murders of Libby German and Abby Williams, and also the man charged with those February of 2017 murders. A team of 13 news journalists has been poring over the documents this afternoon. Rich Nye joins us from the newsroom with what we've learned. Rich? Richard Allen's attorneys want the search warrant of his house overturned and all the evidence collected there last October thrown out. The prosecution's response gives us several new details about what investigators believe happened to Libby German and Abby Williams. <laughs> investigators say that is Allen's voice, and he is the man in the video taken by Libby's phone who ordered the girls down the hill. And in that same video, investigators believe they hear the sound of a gun being cycled, and one of the girls mentioning a gun. Court records say the girls were then forced to the location where they were murdered. And for the first time, we learned that investigators believe a knife was used in the murders. Court records say articles of clothing from the girls were missing from the scene, including a pair of underwear and a sock. Clothes from both girls were found in the creek. A woman says she later saw the man in the bridge video walking down the road wearing a blue jacket and jeans. He was muddy and bloody and looked like he had been in a fight. Police searched Allen's home last October. They seized a handgun, which investigators believe Allen used in the crime, and matches an unspent bullet found next to the girls' bodies. About 10 hunting and utility knives were also confiscated, along with a blue Carhartt jacket and other clothes. Allen has admitted pol to police that he was at the Monon High Bridge the afternoon the girls were killed. He said he went out on the bridge to watch the fish. Welcome to True Crime Garage. A very interesting day here in the garage. The captain and I have had some time to sort through the information that's coming out of Delphi. And here we are to discuss some of the highlights within that information. Now, as many of you know, we've covered this case extensively throughout the years. And this is a case that's always been shrouded in mystery, right? There's always been a, a lot of what ifs or how did this go down? What happened here? Who's responsible? Well, now we have a man locked up. We have a man, Richard Allen, who will be facing a trial in this double homicide case. And very recently, we've had documents that were previously sealed, for the most part, have been released to the public. These documents have been unsealed. They're court documents that have been unsealed and now released to the public. So what comes out to the public here is 283 pages of court documents that have been released, and we've been able to go through all of them with a fine-tooth comb. We've done the legwork so you wouldn't have to, and we are here today to tell you about what it is that we found within those 283 pages. So let's waste no time 
and breaking down these unsealed documents, starting off with the affidavit from the warden. Yes, and so what we have here, Captain, clearly we're not going to go through all 283 pages because reading that many pages of court documents, and man, it's some dry, heavy reading right there. Mm. But what we're talking about here today are some things that jumped off the page to us, the highlights, if you will. And more importantly, I think, too, with some of these items, we say 283 pages of unreleased, previously sealed documents. But in reviewing those 283 pages, there were a lot of those documents that had either leaked their way out at some point or had been released. And so what you have here is you have the media, you have attorneys representing the media who filed request, official court request to have these documents unsealed. And for this once very mysterious investigation and very mysterious charges brought against Richard Allen to have more transparency. And so the judge reviewed these requests and said, sure, the handcuffs are off. The gloves are coming off. Here is the information that you were seeking. So the first thing that caught our eye, and this is because it was newsworthy, back earlier this year in April, we had the defense team coming to Richard Allen's defense saying that he's being mistreated, that he was treated like a prisoner of war in this facility where he's being housed while he awaits his trial. In fact, I believe their statements were that he is living in conditions that are worse than if he were to be convicted of the charges brought against him. So this is an affidavit filed by the warden of the Westville Correctional Facility. So this is part, obviously, of the Indiana Department of Corrections, and this is the warden's opportunity to have a rebuttal of this public outcry, maybe not by the masses, but at least Richard Allen's defense attorneys, that he's being mistreated within this facility, this Westville Correctional Facility. And the warden says that Richard Allen is housed in a segregation unit, of this facility. This is for his protection. He is housed in a 12 by eight cell, which is the standard size cell for that facility. So he's not right away. The warden's going to be pointing out how the conditions this man is being kept in are similar to all the exact same as all of the other persons housed in this facility with the exception of him being in a segregation unit. They state that the defendant has a bed with a mattress, and the mattress is the same mattress that all of the inmates receive at the facility. The bed frame is attached to the floor. This is specific to the segregation units because it's uh, in order to protect the defendant from ways of harming himself. The defendant is in this type of cell for his protection because he has made suicidal statements and could attempt to harm himself. The defendant, Richard Allen, is offered time to shower three times a week, which is the same as the other inmates. He's also provided with three sets of clothing per week. He is afforded commissary privileges and has extra shirts and shoes in his cell, but he chooses not to wear them. Right. The defendant is not required to wear the same clothes or underwear for days and days on end that are soiled, stained, tattered, or torn. He can change those clothes. He may choose not to. The defendant has equal access to clean clothing, as do all of the inmates. The defendant was afforded the use of an electronic tablet where he can make calls, send text, and download music, which is an amenity that the other inmates do not have. So they're stating this this is something that he has been given. It's a privilege as far as the warden's concerned. Simply put, the other inmates do not have this tablet that that Richard Allen has that he can make phone calls on, he can send text, and he can download music. Now, the warden goes on to say that at some point, Richard Allen broke 
this tablet. Yeah, so he had this privilege that nobody else had, but he broke it like a dumbass, so don't have that privilege anymore. The defendant has afforded the same recreation time as all of the other inmates, which is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And he has regularly seen medical personnel and and mental health counselors. It states that the defendant is not afforded face-to-face visitation due to being in the segregation unit. Now, that's interesting because that last part of the statement goes along with what the defense attorneys were saying, that there are difficulties in meeting with their client. One, the distance between where they're located and the facility where he's being housed. There's difficulties with the defendant speaking with and meeting with his family. Again, this is due to the distance between the two, but also the hoops that one has to jump through once you get to this facility because Allen is stored or being housed in a stored makes it sound like he's a he's a product in the back of of a stock room somewhere uh, that he's being housed in a segregation unit. Yeah, and I know there's rumors that are saying that guards and, and other prisoners are, are telling Richard to to kill himself. But let's let's not forget what he's what he is accused of doing. He's accused of killing a thirteen and fourteen year old. So I, I I really don't have any I don't feel bad for this individual. You know, he has it better than most and I think right now the conditions that they're in are probably keeping him alive. And I think once he has to go face more of a, the general population in prison, it's not going to go so well for Richard M. Allen. That's a difficult thing for us to sit here and talk about on Mike, because we do recognize that he is innocent until proven guilty in the court of law, which has not happened yet. And unfortunately, there have been. I'm not. I'm not going to sit here and raise a great defense for Richard Allen. There are twelve people that will be selected by the courts that will be given more information than we have that will determine if he is guilty of these crimes or not. Yeah, if we that's get that that's far. not my job. But but the difficult thing becomes we do know there have been innocent people that have been in the same situation as. Richard Allen. Some of them found guilty. Some of them f- found not guilty. Now, but but what I think the captain's pointing out here, and one thing I will agree with 100%, this is what he's charged of. Guards verbally harassing him, that's not right. Yeah, we get nobody saying that that's right. Nobody's saying, good job, guards. The other inmates harassing him, if in fact this is all going down, right? If this, let's be clear right. about that. If this is actually happening, nobody's saying here at True Crime Garage, good job, guards, good job, inmates. But what we are saying is this is not out of the norm. Typically, somebody charged with these kinds of crimes, it's not unheard of that they're being verbally harassed by the guards or other inmates. That's what happens in prison. That's what happens in these types of facilities, especially when we're talking about inmate to inmate. That's why jail and prison are such an undesirable place to be. So the defense is claiming that their client is not being treated fairly. And now they're also saying we have not received all the information, all the investigative information from the state. Yeah. And th- again, we we have really put a magnifying glass on this case and everything that's going on in and around the courts with this case. So what I think we have here, Captain, is a lot of people becoming aware of things that are very common in these types of cases and people kind of wondering, is this common, one? And two, is there something else going on here? Well, in this case, this this I would expect, okay, let's let's pretend for a minute I had to hire counsel to defend me against any kind of charges. I would expect good counsel good defense attorneys to file this motion. We've not, we've not received all of the discovery. We've not received all of the state's case against our client. You do that for it. Look, you're, you're creating a long list of checks and balances because in this type of case where he he could end up being charged and if convicted sentenced to death, right? 
you are creating a long paper trail for your client of things that might be a, appealed later. So you file this motion that way, if you could later prove that the state did not provide you with all of the information, then you have grounds for an appeal. You could even have grounds for a mistrial. So this is the state's rebuttal to those claims of, well, we've not received all the information. Now, I, I should be clear here, too, because my understanding of this, Captain, is the the state has come forward and said, we're still working on some of our case. So there may be things you've not received, but it's we've not built that part of our case against your client yet. Here, they are going line by line and explaining why we've not sent this to the defense. And I'm going to give you the short of it because it's, I don't know. It's extensive. It's extensive. There's at least 28 statements that they give in this. There's probably more because uh, I, I went through and highlighted the ones that I thought to be the most important. And my list stops at 28. Again, this was a review of 283 pages of documents. They all didn't make it onto the show. But the short of it is the state is saying, this is information that we've not sent to you because of several reasons. And these all fall within the rule book here. One, this is information that's readily available to you. So it's not our job to provide it to you. We don't have to do the legwork for you. You can go and get this information yourself. No one's preventing you from having this information. We don't work for the defense. You can go get this information. The The other response is that some of this information is too cumbersome for the state to provide to the defense. Meaning, like, they're requesting... Any and all tips, any and all communication regarding this case from the general public to the law enforcement agencies that were investigating the case. Well, and we know, yeah, and we know because of Carter. I mean, there's been thousands upon thousands of interactions from the public to law enforcement. Didn't we report one time that there were like over forty seven thousand tips that came in throughout yeah. the course of this? Like so, and that was years ago, right? And we know that Carroll County and the Indiana State Police, Indiana State Police, is a big agency, lots of resources, lots of people power, and they decided together that you know what we need the FBI to work the tip line to take ownership of the tip line for us because there's so many tips coming in. And that was rel relatively early on in this investigation. I want to say it was like 20 days in. And as you said, Captain, as you backed me up there, it was like 40-some thousand tips. And that was years ago. Ye at least two years before Richard Allen was arrested. So they're simply saying we cannot provide you with all that information because it would bog us down with too much work. And oh, by the way, we do not intend to use all of that communication from the general public to law enforcement against your client, meaning that it, a lot of that information that they're requesting is not relevant. Now, there are ways for the defense to still obtain that information, and it, it, we'll, we'll see how this thing shakes out because I know that a new trial date has been set for Richard Allen for the actual murder charges. Right. There's going to be other court proceedings before them. Those have not been given dates yet, but trust me. Do you know the date of the new trial? I believe it was scheduled for January of 2024. And the reason why I've, I've not noted that date here in my notes is that to me, that date does not seem so significant because with these other court proceedings that will, it's not an if, that will take place. I would bet that this thing gets pushed back even further. Right. Probably summer of 2024. And Unless, without without you and I getting too far into the weeds here, 
we also have some speculation that this thing may it, it may drag on for a while with different court proceedings, but we may never actually see a trial. Right. Moving along, let's go over the cause documents. Yes, and this is pretty straightforward. It's really a description of the the charge, which is mel- uh, murder, a felony, two felony counts of murder. And it's the bail that was set for Richard Allen. Now, this could be something that was known to the general public. This is something I've never seen in writing before. And I don't recall it here hitting the old colonel's earballs either. So uh, this seemed interesting to me. The bail was set at $20 million cash or corporate security, I believe is what that scribbled word is there. So $20 million was the bail set for Richard Allen. The next item here, Captain, is a judgment of the court. So this is pretty straightforward here. This is the the state has subpoenaed the CVS Corporation, who Richard Allen worked for. They're subpoenaing them for documents. I don't think I said that right at all. They are they are requesting, demanding, and people think I'm a dumbass that CVS turn over certain documents about and information about Richard Allen to them. Now we can speculate here what that is. Right. My number one thing would be his time records for the the week and the day of the murders. That would be key for them to establish that he was not elsewhere during that time period. So that's pretty normal stuff. And it was the defense team that then they come out and say, no, no, we're going to, we're going to push through a motion that that's unnecessary. The state does not need that information. And this is just a judgment of the court of saying the court has decided that it's fine for the state to demand that information and that CVS should be giving that information to the state. Yeah, it's pretty simple. You have a guy that's charged with double homicide and you want his work records. That's one of the most common things that a state would do in any homicide case is request information, demand information from one's employer, the suspect's employer. The next item is the state's objection to defense defendant's motion to suppress. This is very common as well. So basically what you have, the short of it, Captain, is that you have the state that says, here's how we built the case against this man enough to arrest him and house him until he can face trial. And so typically what you will see is the defense team will then come out and they will file a motion that says, We question all of that information, all that evidence that led you to the arrest and to you housing him and then trying him for these charges. And we want a judge to determine if this information is good, if this evidence is good enough to keep him or to even have charged him in the first place. Very, very common that you would look a good defense team. So if any of our wonderful listeners out there ever find themselves on the hot seat for something that they are completely innocent of, and you hire a defense attorney, if you are wealthy enough that you can hire a team, um, in this situation, I believe that the state is paying for both of these attorneys. So he does have some kind of team here. It's probably more than just two working this, but demand your counsel, demand your attorney's question everything that's what they should be doing they question everything and this is just further proof that they are doing their due diligence the defense team in this case so correct me uh if i'm wrong but the the search warrant uh, that wasn't released but the affidavit to get the search warrant was possibly leaked at some point six years of this case and so much of it uh has been (laughs) been a giant question mark i can't recall captain if that search warrant uh affidavit was leaked or if it was officially released but i can say this 
I've reviewed that document prior to these documents being unsealed. Right. Now, what we do have here is the actual search warrant, which is just a single page, and it's the the state, it's the judge, Diener, who was originally on the case before passing it off, it was Judge Diener granting the search warrant to the Carroll County Sheriff's Department. And it describes what they are allowed to search and what they are allowed to collect. And with so much of this case being shrouded in mystery, the, these these are the type of documents that, to me, really tells you kind of what their what their investigation was and what they were looking for. And so here they state that the state of Indiana grants this permission for the search and the seizure of property that's listed here so they're allowed to search richard allen's property including the residence outbuildings i believe there was a it specifically states a wooden shed that was on the property a black 2016 ford focus se vehicle all of these and and it gives the address i'm not going to go that far look some of this information again it's public if you want to go find it great um, well, thanks for being so helpful. <laughs> that's that's why they're here is to learn about it. But they're talking about that they are allowed to search all of those parts of the property, including that vehicle that is listed there, and they are allowed to remove any and all evidence and information of the crime of murder, specifically a search for handguns, forty caliber ammunition, knives blue sweatshirts or jackets, black sweatshirts or jackets, clothing, electronic devices, a cell phone, and they're very specific with the cell phone that they're looking for, right? and any other cell phones. So that's kind of a, a blanket statement, right? You go, all right, we can collect this one cell phone that we're looking for plus any other ones, and any other electronic devices located in or on the locations described in this document. Law enforcement is authorized to search these areas to determine whether or not there has been a violation committed as described in the affidavit at the residence, in the yard, the vehicle, or any word that I do not know. (laughs) Um, So this is just giving a very basic description of what they're looking for. What's key here, and what I've always found fascinating about this case, Captain, is that in every search that they've ever done, even with remove Richard Allen's name from it they've always specifically and I think this is pretty common to 2023 2022 very specifically looking for electronic devices right cell phones tablets things of that nature now in this case it has been said by law enforcement on multiple occasions that they are of the belief that some of the the crimes may have been documented via an electronic device or taking pictures or any of those things. Now, we've not heard that they've found proof of that, but that certainly was a, a consideration and speculation by law enforcement. In fact, we do know when we reviewed the search warrant affidavit uh, for Ron Logan, that the wording that they chose to use was we're looking for an electronic device that was receiving a cell signal in that area on that day. And they even give like a window of time there. So we've always wondered, does this mean that they have proof? We know that they did the data dump trying to locate all of the cell phones that were in the area within a five mile radius that day when the girls went missing up till a certain time of day. I, I don't know how long they extended it, but law enforcement had always said that they believed everything was done and over with by 5 PM. So we've always wondered, does that mean that they have information from that data dump that there was some type of cellular device or, or electronic device receiving a cell signal in that location that day that they've not identified right. the, the user, the carrier of that device. Mm-hmm. 
So this is just a, another document that they are looking for something very similar. And then that leads us to the affidavit for the search warrant uh, that was granted. This goes through a lot of the same stuff that we've talked about in the past. And so I'll summarize a lot of that. This is the law enforcement laying out their case for the judge saying, we need a search warrant and here's the evidence why. And they go through a description of the crime. We've talked about that they believe they're looking for a gun because they one of the girls says gun to the other girl in the 43 second video that was the, the recording that was on Libby's phone. And so that's why gun is listed. And we, we would later learn in other documents, it, it doesn't go into specifics and I don't think that's needed, but it does state that their, their deaths were ruled a homicide due to wounds or injuries from a sharp object. Well, so, and also they were looking for a gun because they had a shell casing that they're going to try to match up as well. Exactly. Exactly. So they give those two reasons for looking for guns. And then obviously with the statement of what it has been determined that they were killed with, that they are looking for sharp objects and knives and things of that nature as well. So like you said, they said gun on the video. And so we're looking for a gun believing that the killer controlled them with a gun to go down the hill, but then used a sharp object, possibly a knife, to commit the murders. This document is a bit of a bummer for me here, Captain. And that is because when... You're a bit of a bummer for all of us. This document specifically was... Look, this just jogged my memory completely here. So this document some form of it was released. Remember, this was the document that was sealed per the state. The judge signs off on sealing it, and the state was saying, we need this to be sealed because it has witness information. It identifies witnesses. And remember, the, de the defense was saying, no, we need transparency. We don't think that the state has a good case against our client. If the, if the public could see some of this, they may agree with us. So this document should be unsealed. They, they said publicly, we don't see anything in this document that warrants the arrest of our client. And so remember, this document was released but redacted. Well, they've removed the, the redactions here on this document. So that was a bit of a, a, bit of a bummer for me. Um, it's not a whole lot of new information, but it's... It, for those who have not re reviewed it previously, they're talking about witnesses that put somebody that looks like Richard Allen, that was dressed like Richard Allen at the trails that day, coming and going and leaving, looking rather disheveled, muddied, bloodied. Uh, one person describes it as it looked like he had been in a fight. One of the witnesses says that they believe he was covering his face. Uh, with, there was some kind of face covering that he was wearing when, when seen now, none of these people were saying it was Richard Allen there that day on the, you know, on the trails, but they're saying it, they're all confirming. They're all saying about the same thing and describing somebody that not only looks like the person, the person's image that we see in, in, on Libby's phone video, right. but also looks like Richard Allen. And then on top of that, we have Richard Allen who admits to being there that day. And this does give good reason to search his property. A lot more to get to after this quick beer break. All right, we are back. Cheers, mates. Cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers to the captain. Cheers to one and all tall cans in the air. And we've covered so many cases, but it seems like this is a lot of information. Like you said, 280-some documents. I, and I believe that they didn't unseal about 19 documents out of the, the whole kid and caboodle. 
But uh, it seems like this is a lot of information coming out before the trial. Look, as much as I was on a quest for information in this case, just like everybody else, I th- I think this is a little unsettling to me. All if, again, 12 people with more information than me will determine this man's guilt. I can't sit here in this garage two beers deep and tell you 100% that this guy's guilty. He looks really guilty. I'm not going to build a defense for him. But... All I care about is convicting the right person. I'm a little worried that you've tainted any type of jury pool with some of this information that's coming out. Right. And some of it, the the, the big stuff, which I think will taint the potential jurors, we've not even gotten to yet. So uh, hold on to your butts, right? Hold on to your nuts and butts. I hope I hope you wore your raincoat and boots because there's going to be some shit. Mm, some shit. Um, some other information in here that I think the that people will find fascinating. If this is, it may be something they already know, but there this document indicates that there may be video footage of a vehicle either matching Richard Allen's vehicle or a vehicle very similar to his seen driving what what could be assumed i've not seen this video but it's stated it's described here in this document that one could make an easy assumption that this vehicle is going toward the trails and then coming from the trails and yeah. going to the trails before the abduction and murders and coming from the trails afterward yeah and this could be <sighs> This could be kind of a nothing burger because we do have records of him stating that he was at the park that day, but this could be confirmation of that and confirmation of what vehicle he was driving. My other speculation is, is it possible that it's video footage of not him entering the park, but entering the service road into the park, the one that would line up with the bridge um, and you know down the hill? And was his vehicle on that service road? Um, that's just speculation on, on my part because that would be pretty damning. You're on the bridge. You you meet up with the girls. You tell them to go down the hill. Your vehicle was parked down there. This murder takes place, and then you get in your vehicle and you and you leave through the service road. Correct. So this video, this video evidence. Potential video evidence is described as coming from a store. And so I imagine that this is a a camera that either they have in their parking lot. Hell, we've seen how much ring doorbell cameras and simply safe doorbell cameras are picking up people, things that that are going on in the street in front of someone's house. Right. uh, That they have nothing to do with, but these images are captured and and digitized and, and later able to be used as evidence against different people. And and one of the things that I wanted to reiterate when you were talking about the the initial search that they did, you know, searching his property and gathering clothes and 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 people in in Richard's life coming forward and saying, well, he, he didn't throw away these clothes, and and now we we assume that this murder took place, you know, with a sharp object, a, a knife. So they collect a bunch of knives from his property. But what they did with the car uh, is they did a bunch of luminol test, and wherever luminol hit in that vehicle, they cut up the carpet from the wheel wells. They they cut up pieces of the seat belt, um, pieces of the seat. So you would you would assume too maybe those haven't been tested completely. Again, another argument by. The defense team of hey, do we get the do we get those tests back yet? Because all that information, as the defense team, the bigger of a, of a pile of evidence against your client, you might just des- decide to defend your client differently based off the information that the state is providing you. Right, and so if if those items, if and when, well, I shouldn't say if or when they. One hundred percent, they're going to t- test them. If they if they don't test them, I mean, come on, what are you guys doing? Um, those items have been or will be tested. That information 
should, if if everybody's doing their jobs and playing with inside the rules, that those results will be provided to the defense. That's all part of discovery. Right. Um, so yes, that's, that's all part of it. The, the thing that I find, uh, well, in fact, you know what, let's stay on topic here because the next item that we wanted to cover was the property record and receipt. This is a document that is going to take inventory of all of the items that were collected from Richard Allen's home, right? From his property, from his vehicle. And you're right, captain. They, they, they did do those things with, with the vehicle. And I, I don't want to go through this line by line because it's, it's four pages, but just to give everybody a little bit of a taste here. So of course they, they take into their possession a gun, the the Sig Sauer P226 handgun. They took into possession two magazines, one filled with nine forty caliber cartridges and one with eight forty caliber car- cartridges. Right. It looks to me that the gun, the Sig Sauer P226, that they believe was at the crime scene, at the murder scene, that when they confiscated that gun, that it had a cartridge with the gun that had a a single forty caliber Smith and Wesson bullet in the that cartridge. The uh they they also took like the case and a whole bunch of uh, cellular devices. So it looks to me like the the Allens are probably like a lot of other people where you g- you go through phones, you're done with a phone and they end up in a junk drawer somewhere, usually with a bunch of old chargers and things of that nature. So there's a whole bunch of car chargers, outlet chargers and old flip phones and old phones that appear to have been confiscated as well. Now, we do know that the the handgun, as far as lab exam goes, they checked that box. That's stated on this document. Uh, a cartridge that was, they found a forty caliber cartridge found in a wooden keepsake box on a dresser between both closets in the master bedroom. I don't know why this bullet is in a different location than the other ones, but that's the bullet that they chose to to test. So they would have fired that gun. They would have checked that gun to see if it, if, if it malfunctions or there's any malfunctioning with that gun confirm that there's no malfunctions. And then they would test that bullet. So they, they wouldn't fire it in this situation. Typically we're, we're firing it for the ballistics test, but here we're simply racking it through the gun and then testing Yeah, it's simpler and doing a lab exam on those marks in comparison to the live round found at the murder scene. Right. And we talk so much about electronic devices. Well, here they, they took at least one flash drive. Um, I think later in this document, they reference another, but they don't list them together because the other one's listed as a zip drive. They confiscated a whole lot of sweatshirts, a whole lot of sweatshirt. Every sweatshirt this guy had, it appears is on this list for obvious reasons they're trying to find the what appears to be the hoodie or jacket uh, worn by bridge guy that day so a lot of jackets a lot of hoodies they took a lot of he's got a lot of of sharp items a lot of knives yeah i would be surprised if they find any evidence on a, a sweater but look i mean the criminals have been dumb for years uh, yeah. But I think it would be an easy item for him to discard, uh, especially the property that he had. I mean, he had a little bit of land. He could have easily had a little bonfire and got rid of uh, some evidence. I loved, we talked about that when his defense team came out and said, look, his gun, his car, his clothing, all the things that he had that day when he was out walking the trails, mine in his own business, uh, he still has to this day. That's proof that he's innocent. Well, it's it certainly raises a bit of an argument of innocence. However, it's very easy to quash that argument and just go, he might just be a dumbass. 
He might, he might have just not discarded of these items because he's lazy or he's dumb, or maybe there's something more sinister and some kind of souvenir to him. Yeah, and the thing is, you know, he Richard M. Allen is innocent till proven guilty, but the jury's out on on what he looks like. He he looks like a dumbass. <laughs> I mean, if I saw him, I go, that's that's a dumbass. Unfortunately, I've had the same said about me. Now. The, a lot of sharp o- objects, a lot of knives, a lot of bladed weapons found, some of them decorative in nature, some of them folding knives, some of them large. So a lot of that's been confiscated from his home. You have to wonder here, Captain, you can clean those knives, but we've seen this in dozens of homicide cases involving a, a knife. Often they can remove the handle or the hilt and find blood that has seeped under there, yeah. That that the the suspect was unable to clean from that object. They're more likely to find the victim's blood than they are to match the wounds to the weapon, because that is a difficult task um, for 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 forensics. A lot of times, when there is a knife used in the murder, they they can go well. We can rule out that these 10 knives weren't used, but these other five knives that he have could have been used. Correct. Because a lot of times that is a little bit open to interpretation. Yes. And so often you, what you will hear in the courts or even on Dateline or what have you, where the expert is saying the wounds suffered by the victim are similar to what I would expect to see from someone if they chose to use this knife as the murder weapon. Yeah, and think about that. We're trying to, without a shadow of a doubt, can, can, I was like, make noise. What we're trying to do is, without a shadow of a doubt, prove that this guy committed these crimes or did not prove these crimes. So when you do the ballistics with the gun, that's going to be difficult with the casing because it doesn't have every single marking on that. Anybody that wants to dive more into these ballistic tests and how they go down, uh, our buddy Fig Solves on YouTube it, uh, just interviewed a FBI agent that does these ballistic tests, and they go into depth on how this test would, um, how these tests are, oper- how they operate these tests, but also what is the well, in this case, and that that's actually one of our documents that we have for review here, is they 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 straight out state this is not so much a scientific test. This is a microscopic comparison. Right. We 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 took the two, the one found at the murder scene, and one that we racked through his gun, same caliber, same bullet racked through this Sig Sauer P226 handgun, and we compared them under a microscopic lens, and our expert, our state's expert, has stated it is of their opinion that this gun made those markings on the bullet that was found at the crime scene. So what will happen, again, I don't think it's an if, it's a it will happen, the defense team will then find a air quotes expert to say, I compared them as well. And it is of my opinion that this gun did not. And maybe you might, and, and look, if you get a really honest one, maybe you get an expert that says we can't rule out this gun, but, um, there's, you could get an expert that says there's 21,000 other guns out there that could have made this, these same marks. There's, there's the same, you know, let's, I don't know how many of those guns were produced, that type of make and model were produced, but I would think that, that somebody could come forward and say, it, you could put this in any six hour P226 handgun and rack it through and it would make similar, if not almost identical marks. So that, that's something I don't know, have enough knowledge of. But I'm letting you all know, don't be so surprised when that happens. Well, and this is how they have to create a case against somebody. If you don't have the definitive evidence, again, 
the matching the stab wounds to a knife is not definitive. Right. The the ballistic test is not definitive. Some of these other tests that they're going to run are not definitive. Eyewitness statements might not be definitive, but certainly you, not. You keep having a you keep building that pile. And and what and what I think will happen is the more they build that pile and the more that the defense doesn't know how to defend their client hopefully we see a a deal made and and a deal that law enforcement works with the family members and and their su- surviving victims of this tragic crime most murder convictions are built and come off of the backs of cases that are built on a mountain of circle circumstantial evidence so it wouldn't be crazy for that to be the situation in here as well but like you talked about with the knives it could come down to someone's expert opinion but more than likely if you confiscated all these and this guy and his team are all happy about well he didn't discard any of these things it i would be surprised if this dude wasn't so dumb that he didn't just just i mean you're right by the water when you killed him, you could have just chucked that knife in the water somewhere and hope that the current takes it mm-hmm. or, or hope that they don't find it off of their first search or second search or third search. And it becomes lost or buried or gone forever. Or he takes it home and failed to remove the hilt or the handle. And there is, if you find the victim's blood on, on an item in his possession, right? Get out the hangman because that case, his goose is cooked. Yeah, we're looking for blood and mud in this case. They collected, as said, a lot of different electronic devices, even chargers and things of that nature. And before we get to the vehicle stuff, uh, note, they confiscated an, a white NFL Colts skull cap. So if you were looking for a reason to jump off of that team and find a new one, um, maybe, maybe that's the straw that broke the camel's back. <laughs> All right. Although I do like that quarterback that they got coming in. Watch out for him. Mm-hmm. He's going to be a electric. Um, so for the car stuff, captain, so they, they, as you were talking about, they confiscated, a, they, they made a sealed envelope containing a cutting of carpeted area underneath the spare tire of the Ford focus. And they also collected two plastic wrappers containing one swab from a driver lap belt and one swab from the driver shoulder belt of the Ford Focus. And then they took two swabs from the passenger side carpeting floorboard area. So what they're doing here, as the captain pointed out, they didn't really cut apart any of the seat belts or anything. They just swabbed them. Um, and so they're looking for DNA. That would be his DNA. Uh, anybody that's been in his vehicle's DNA, as well as potential blood evidence. And of those three items, the only one that is stated that, that they did a lab exam was the carpet that was cut. And they cut that from under the spare tire. This actually tells me I have a different interpretation as to why they would have done this uh, than, than what you stated previously here, Captain. Well, you're wrong is that I'm guessing this is strictly for fiber evidence. I wouldn't expect to, if I'm the investigator and I'm searching this vehicle underneath the spare tire would be a place that I would, I would think would be less likely to have victim blood or victim DNA in that location as compared to other locations in that, in that vehicle. So I think this might just be simply for a fiber analysis and again, that was the only sample that is noted here that was actually tested from items taken from the vehicle. This is probably just them doing their due diligence with those swabs. But again, we, we don't know. We're, I, I could be completely off the mark here. We're not the ones conducting this investigation.
For everything true crime, check out truecrimegarage.com. Thank you so much for joining us here in the garage each and every week. Join us back here tomorrow, same bat time, same bat channel, for the conclusion of the unsealed documents in the Delphi Murders case investigation. And until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.